honor and privilege and pleasure to be here today in this beautiful temple of Sri Sri Radha Gopinath. And for those of you who are visiting for the first time, we welcome you and hope that you have a wonderful experience, which I expect you will. In every field of activity, there are procedures and authorities. If you want to learn how to play a musical instrument, you need a teacher. And he will uh, explain to you the procedures for learning to play the instrument. If you want to learn to cook a particular preparation, there are procedures. You need a, a teacher who, who can explain and show you how to do it. So in spiritual life also, there are procedures and authorities. Unfortunately, uh, there are people who imagine that in spiritual life, you can be your own authority. Uh, but that is not the case. Uh, that you can be your own authority and make up your own process. Actually, uh, dharman tu sakshat bhagavat pranitam, the path of dharma is chalked out by the Lord himself. The original authority is God. And any other authority in the spiritual line derives his authority from God through disciplic succession. In other words, God is the origin of everything. He's also the origin of perfect knowledge. And he imparts perfect knowledge to a direct disciple or a, a number of direct disciples. In our line, his first student is Lord Brahma. Tene Brahma Hridaya Adhikavaye. He, he imparted spiritual knowledge to Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma imparted the same knowledge to his disciple Narada. Narada instructed the same knowledge to his disciple Vyas. And in this way the knowledge has come down through parampara or disciplic succession to our more recent teachers who are, whose uh, pictures are on the altar. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, then Srila Prabhupada, who is our teacher. And we are also uh, presenting the same knowledge. So in this transcendental science, there are certain textbooks. The main ones are the Bhagavad Gita, which is the basic textbook for all types of yoga. Then uh, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, or the Nectar of Devotion, which is the 
textbook specifically for bhakti yoga and then Srimad Bhagavatam and then Chaitanya Charitamrita. Today I'm going to read a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam which is uh, a more advanced text but I'm confident that you'll be able to uh, follow and I will also try to give some background information as we proceed. So please repeat after me. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 You read from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 3 Pure Devotional Service, text 23. Jivan Chavo Bhagavatam Gri Renum Najatu Martyo Bilabeta Yastu Sri Vishnu Padya Manujastu Lasya Swasan Chavo Yastu Naveda Gandam Jivan Chavo Bhagavatangri Renum Najatu Martyo Bilabeta Yastu Sri Vishnu Padya Manujastu Lasya Svasan Chava Yastu Naveda Gandam Translation the person who has not at any time received the dust of the feet of the Lord's pure devotee upon his head is certainly a dead body. And the person who has never experienced the aroma of the tulsi leaves from the lotus feet of the Lord is also a dead body, although breathing. Please repeat. The person, the person who, has not at any time who has not at any time received the dust of the feet of the Lord's pure devotee Upon his, head, upon his head is certainly a dead body. And the person who has never experienced the, the aroma of the Tulsi leaves from the lotus feet of the Lord is also a dead body. Although breathing. Although breathing. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. According to Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, the breathing dead body is a ghost. When a man dies, he is called dead. But when he again appears in a subtle form, not visible to our present vision, and yet acts, such a dead body is called a ghost. Now when I first met Srila Prabhupada and the devotees in Boston, in 1969, 
I gradually found that all the questions I ever had in my mind were being answered by the devotees. I was, I was in my uh, last year at the university and we'd heard of so many things, like you, you've all heard of ghosts and another one was Cupid and just on and on and on. And these were all concepts, but I had no real information whether these things were real, if they ex existed, and if they did exist, what they actually were. And then, when I met Srila Prabhupada and the devotees, I got answers, one after the other after the other. So, what is a ghost? So first we have to understand what is a, a, a living being. Uh, the, the living force uh, is the atma, the, the soul, the spirit soul. And as long as the soul is in the body, the body appears to be alive. But actually, the body is just a machine. The body is never actually alive, but when the soul is in the body, it animates the body and it moves the body. Now the body has two aspects, the gross and the subtle. So the soul is covered by a subtle body, which is mind, intelligence, and ego, or false ego. Many people, they, they cannot distinguish between spirit and subtle matter. They may equate the mind with the soul, but actually the soul is spiritual, the mind is material, but it is subtle. So mind, intelligence, and false ego are the subtle body. And then we have the gross body, arms, legs, head, belly, uh, all, all the different senses, the gross senses of perception and the working senses. Uh, is the gross body. Now, accor ac according to uh, the Bhagavad Gita, when the soul leaves the body, it gets another body, according to its activities in life and its thoughts at the time of death. And if one has acted Piously, one can get a better body on a higher planet. If one's activities are sort of mixed, one uh, can take birth again as a human being. Uh, and, and if one's activities are vicious and rather than virtuous, uh, then one can take birth as an animal. Or, or take birth in a more hellish situation on a lower planet. So what is a ghost? The, the basic principle is that whatever you desire, uh, as shown by your activities and consciousness, God will fulfill. Just like if you want to eat anything and everything at all day and night, so in your next life you can take birth as a pig. If you want to sleep and sleep and sleep without being disturbed, 
in your next life you can take a birth as a bear who go into hibernation. Uh, and you know, if you, if you want to if you lead a godly life, you can take a, a, a higher birth. Now, a ghost, generally people who commit suicide uh, become ghosts in their next life because generally someone commits suicide because he or she is frustrated. They have material desires, but their desires are not fulfilled. And out of disappointment, they commit suicide. So they have uh, material desires, but, but they committed suicide means they don't want a gross body. So they, they uh, get a ghost body, which means the, the subtle body with all those material desires. But they don't have a gross body to fulfill their desires. Uh, and therefore, they try to take possession of someone who has a gross body to fulfill their desires through that person's body because they don't have gross senses to fulfill their desires. Uh, in general, uh, serious practitioners do not go to the cinema or watch movies, but uh, About 30 years ago, I think, there was a, a, a movie called Ghost. And uh, some devotees saw it, and they were convinced, and it could very well be true, that the writers of that uh, script had read Srimad Bhagavatam had read Srila Prabhupada's <laughs> books. Because it, it, yeah, it was just like that, that this, the person was, I mean, suicide is one way, but it, it can be like another t ghastly death, like an overdose of drugs, or I don't know what. And I don't know all the details of the movie. But, um, so that ghost, he had these material desires, but he couldn't fulfill them. And there's like a scene in the movie where he's like floating around in the, in the uh, train station. And there's a vending machine with cigarettes. And like he, he wants to smoke, but he doesn't have a body to smoke. He doesn't have money to put in the, machi <laughs> in the machine either. So it shows him he's like with this subtle body, he's like slamming the the vending machine trying to get some cigarettes, but he couldn't even break the machine because he didn't have that body. So, um, all right, we'll continue reading the purport. Ghosts are always very bad elements always creating a fearful situation for others. Yes, now what is a haunted house? We've heard of haunted houses. There are such things. Here's another example. Say a man is living in a castle. And at the time of death, out of attachment for his castle or palace, or mansion, he thinks of his palace. So he can't take birth as a palace because that's not a species of life. But he can take birth as a ghost 
at, in that palace, in that castle. But it is uh, also a fact that ghosts cannot remain where there's chanting of the holy names of the Lord. So it has happened in the history of, of uh, the Krishna consciousness movement that there were very big properties available, haunted houses, for a very low price because people don't want to buy a haunted house. <laughs> But Srila Prabhupada encouraged the devotees that you can, you get it. And you do uh, Harinam Sankirtan, you chant the holy names, and the ghosts will leave. And we can have a nice temple for Krishna. So ghosts are always very bad elements, always creating a fearful situation for others. Similarly, the ghost-like non-devotees who have no respect for the pure devotees nor for the Vishnu deity in the temples create a fearful situation for the devotees at all times. The Lord never accepts any offering by such impure ghosts. So, ultimately, everyone is a, a spirit soul. Everyone is a, a part and parcel of God, a loving servant of God and all of his creation. But just like when, if someone is possessed by a ghost, he will have thoughts and desires that are not really his. They're the ghosts. So one who is not a devotee, in other words, who is not in his original consciousness as a servant of God, is like a person haunted by a ghost because he has these thoughts and desires that are not really his. They're not really his spirit they don't really belong to his spiritual essence but they're just in his mind so that's why ghosts that's why non devotees are compared to ghosts it's not like calling them a name but it's actually what they're like because they have all these extraneous thoughts and desires that aren't really uh, of the soul There is a common saying that one should first love the dog of the beloved before one shows any loving sentiments for the beloved. That's another saying uh, in America. Love me, love my dog. <laughs> but there's a spiritual counterpart to that. The stage of pure devotion is attained by sincerely serving a pure devotee of the Lord. The first condition of devotional service to the Lord is therefore to be a servant of a pure devotee. And this condition is fulfilled by the statement Reception of the dust of the lotus feet of a pure devotee who has also served another pure devotee. That is the way of pure disciplic succession or devotional parampara. For example, our spiritual master Srila Prabhupada, he served his spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur served his spiritual master, Srila Gorky Shordas Babaji Maharaj. And in this way, 
every uh, authority in the line is really but the servant of his spiritual master who is the servant of his spiritual master who is the servant of his spiritual master. And that chain goes all, we, all the way back to Krishna, to the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this verse says that the person who has not at any time received the dust of the feet of the Lord's pure devotee upon his head is certainly a dead body. That means that if one has not received instructions from a pure devotee, who has in turn received instructions from another pure devotee, and received instructions means one should follow the instructions, that means one should serve the instructions, then he's, he's like a ghost because he's haunted by all these crazy ideas of, of uh, material enjoyment and mental speculation. He's not in his normal consciousness. So, it's actually a very uh, beautiful process that one uh, re receives instruction from his spiritual master and serves the instructions and repeats the instructions and engages others in following the instructions and in this way the line, the parampara, continues. Maharaj Rahugana inquired from the great saint Jud Bharat as to how he had attained such a liberated stage of a Paramahamsa, that means a fully self-realized soul. And in answer, the great saint replied as follows, Srimad Bhagavatam 5, 12, 12. Rahu ganaita tapasanayati na chej yaya nirvapanad grihadva na chandasanai vajalagni suryair Vina Mahat Padarajo Bishekam. O King Rahugana, the perfectional stage of devotional service, or the Paramahansa stage of life, cannot be attained unless one is blessed by the dust of the feet of great devotees. It is never attained by tapasya, austerity, the Vedic worshipping process, acceptance of the renounced order of life, the discharge of the duties of household life, the chanting of the Vedic hymns, or the performance of penances in the hot sun, within cold water, or before the blazing fire. In other words, there are so many processes. Uh, if anyone goes to the Kumbha Mela, uh, it's a great spiritual fair held every 12 years. And there are yogis and uh, practitioners of all different types. But by all those different processes, one cannot achieve the real goal of life. One cannot realize God and one's eternal relationship with God. One can do so only by taking shelter of the instructions of a pure devotee who has in turn taken shelter of the instructions of another 
pure devotee. And again, those instructions are coming originally from Krishna, who is the original guru. And his instructions are given in the Bhagavad Gita directly by him. And two verses uh, summarize the instructions very nicely. Manmana uh, bhavamad bhakto. Always engage your mind in thinking of Krishna and become Krishna's devotee. Madhyaji mam namaskaru. One should uh, worship Krishna and offer obeisances to Krishna. And that is the process that's being taught in this temple. And manmana, first, always think of Krishna. We are in the uh, in the present age, known as Kali Yuga, the best way to think of Krishna is to always chant his holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Just to chant uh, the holy names, Hare Krishna, and to hear about Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. Especially chanting. Uh, so, these, the, 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 the instructions of the devotee are really just the instructions of Krishna. In the next verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Sarva dharman paritya jaya mamekam saranam braja. Krishna says, surrender to me. And the pure devotee says, surrender to Krishna. So it's the same. It's the same. The, 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 the guru should be transparent. Whatever Krishna says, the the devotee repeats. And whatever service is rendered to, to the guru, the guru passes on to his guru, who passes it on to his guru and all the way to Krishna. So it's a, a clear channel. <laughs> it's a clear channel. The knowledge comes from Krishna through parampara and the service goes to Krishna through parampara. In other words, Lord Sri Krishna is the property of his pure, unconditional devotees. And as such, only the devotees can deliver Krishna to another devotee. Krishna is never obtainable directly. So I've mentioned that uh, our immediate predecessor Acharya was Srila Prabhupada. And for those of you who are new, uh, I will just mention briefly that he met his spiritual master in the year 1922. And at the very first meeting, his spiritual master instructed him to repeat the message of Krishna uh, in the English language for the benefit of people all over the world. At that time, no one from this line had ever uh, come out of India. Although it was predicted some hundreds of years earlier that it would happen, but 
No one had done it and no one could even imagine that it could be done. And then finally, in the year 1965, almost at the age of 70 years, uh, Srila Prabhupada left India. He got a free passage on a steam ship, cargo ship, and came to New York City. And he struggled in New York City, but he persevered and eventually some American uh, boys and girls joined him. And then in 1970, Srila Prabhupada wanted to return to India with some of his American and European disciples to uh, revive uh, the, the spiritual culture of India. Because as he said, uh, the Indians are very expert at imitating. They especially like to imitate the Americans. So if the Americans chant Hare Krishna, so the Indians might imitate that as well. And it, it actually did happen like that. And he came back uh, to India in 1970 and traveled throughout India and then gradually established major temples in Mayapur, Vrindavan, and Bombay. So it is really due to him that we are here now. So during that period after he returned to India, but before he established these major temples, I arranged a program for him in Madras. And uh, I met almost all the leading people of Madras. And one person who became very interested was the Chief Justice of the High Court. And uh, he arranged a program for Srila Prabhupada in the grounds, and he invited all the high court justices and uh, lawyers. It was a very distinguished gathering, and, and Srila Prabhupada you know, spoke very strongly, and he, he, he quoted about the six Goswamis who were very, uh, placed in very high positions in society, how they left everything and joined the movement of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And so he was sort of appealing to them that they should do the same thing. <laughs> then after the program, the Chief Justice invited Srila Prabhupada and the disciples to his home for, uh, you know, some refreshment. So he presented uh, Srila Prabhupada a little silver, I think, statue of Krishna. And as, a, as, as an instruction to us, he uh, sort of played with uh, played means interacted with, I think she was maybe three years old, daughter of Srila Prabhupada's uh, early disciples and uh, very, uh, you know, wonderful devotees, Shamsundar Das and Malati Dasi. They had a, a three-year-old daughter named Saraswati. So, Srila Prabhupada held the de the silver deity. I mean, this is this isn't. It was a beautiful deity of Krishna. This is just to give you the idea. Not that we worship. Uh, actually, I'm going to put this away. Um, 
So he held out this beautiful statue of Krishna and sort of caught Saraswati's attention. And uh, he, he said, you see Krishna? She said, yes, 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 yes. And then he, like, he gradually moved the deity and hid the deity behind his back. And then he said, Saraswati, where is Krishna? And she like became panicked, like she couldn't, she couldn't find Krishna. She was like so anxious, her eyes were like darting all over the room and she was like sort of running here and there. She couldn't find him. Then again Prabhupada said, Saraswati, where is Krishna? And the same thing happened. She was like looking everywhere, she couldn't find him. Then finally, uh, one of the devotees, probably Malati uh, Dasi, she said, Saraswati, who has Krishna? And then immediately, like her face lit up and her eyes opened wide with recognition. And she said, Prabhupada has Krishna. <laughs> And then she sort of like ran forward to Prabhupada and Prabhupada pulled out the deity and there was Krishna. So in this uh, simple uh, interaction, he really, Srila Prabhupada really demonstrated a very important principle uh, that he or a, a, the purport says, Lord Krishna is the property of his pure, unconditional devotees. And as such, only the devotees can deliver Krishna to another devotee. But one must be very eager. I mean, although she was just a child, but in her own way, she was very anxious to find Krishna, to see Krishna. And there are other nice songs by Bhaktivinoda Thakur in which he prays to the Vaishnava that you have Krishna and you can deliver Krishna to me. But we have to be sincere to serve Krishna. They have no other desire. Not that the pure devotee will deliver Krishna to you so you can keep Krishna like a pet uh, in your house or as a uh, as a uh, a, a machine to, to fulfill all your material desires. No, but if we desire Krishna, meaning desire to serve Krishna purely, and we have no other desire. And we please our spiritual master by following his instructions and uh, serving him as the representative of Krishna without any ulterior motives. And he can deliver Krishna. Lord Chaitanya therefore designated himself as Gopi Bhartu Padakamalayor Dasa Das Anudasa, or the most obedient servant of the servants of the Lord, who maintains the Gopi damsels at Vrindavan. The Gopis are the most pure lovers of Krishna. They are the greatest devotees of Krishna. And they live in Vrindavan. A pure devotee, therefore, never approaches the Lord directly, but tries to please the servant of the Lord's servants. And thus the Lord becomes pleased. And only then can the devotee relish the taste of the tulsi leaves stuck to the Lord's lotus feet. 
In the Brahma Samhita, it is said that the Lord is never to be found by one's becoming a great scholar of the Vedic literatures, but he is very easily approachable through his pure devotee. In Vrindavan, all the pure devotees pray for the mercy of Srimati Radharani, the pleasure potency of Lord Krishna. On the altar here, the figure playing the flute, of course, is Krishna, Gopinath. And just to his left is Srimati Radharani. And she is very important for us. And I will read why. Srimati Radharani is a tender-hearted, feminine counterpart of the Supreme Whole, resembling the perfectional stage of the worldly feminine nature. In the Nectar of Devotion, Srila Prabhupada explains that because Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it is very difficult to approach him. But he also has his compassionate side, and that compassionate side is represented by Srimati Radharani. And therefore devotees approach Srimati Radharani and she helps them to approach Krishna. Therefore, the mercy of Radharani is available very readily to the sincere devotees because of her tender-hearted nature. And once she recommends such a devotee to Lord Krishna, the Lord at once accepts the devotee's admittance into his association. The conclusion is, therefore, that one should be more serious about seeking the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. And by one's doing so, by the good will of the devotee, the natural attraction for the service of the Lord will be revived. So as we discussed in the beginning, whatever we desire, we get by the grace of the Lord. So if, like I said, if we want to eat anything and everything at all times of day and night, the Lord will fulfill our desire and we'll get the body of a pig. If you want to sleep for six months, you'll get the body of a bear or Kumbhakarna, but <laughs> that's already taken by someone else, so we, we can get the body of a bear. And if we want to serve Krishna, then we will get a body that is suitable for serving Krishna. And because Krishna is completely spiritual, Satchitananda Vigra is the embodiment of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. So if we want to serve him, then we will uh, get the same uh, kind of body. But it doesn't mean we become Krishna, because he is very great and we are very small, but we have the same qualities. God is infinite and we are infinitesimal. But we have the same qualities. Just like a fire 
there's a, uh, the, the spark of the fire has the same qualities as the fire. If a spark comes out of the fire and lands on your leg, you'll get burnt because it has the same qualities. But because the spark is very tiny, if it comes out of the fire, it loses its fiery quality. It just becomes a piece of, like a cinder, just a, a cinder. But that same spark, which has become dark and you know black and cold, if it goes back in the fire, it again regains its fiery quality, its heat and light. So we are like sparks of the fire of Krishna. We've come out of the fire. And instead of manifesting our original qualities of eternal, eternity, knowledge, and bliss, we are in a condition where we're covered by a material body that's temporary and full of ignorance and misery. But if we go back into the fire of Krishna, we revive our spiritual qualities. And going back into the fire of Krishna means associating with Krishna, mainly through the form of transcendental sound, by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and chanting the holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And by serving the deity, one associates with Krishna. By associating with uh, sadhus, one associates with Krishna, because the sadhus always talk about Krishna and carry Krishna in their hearts. And by residing in a holy place like Vrindavan or Mayapur, uh, one is associating with Krishna, one is in the fire. And by associating with Krishna, one's spiritual qualities become revived. The conclusion is, therefore, that one should be more serious about seeking the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. And by one's doing so, by the goodwill of the devotee, the natural attraction for the service of the Lord will be revived. And again, whatever we desire, Krishna will fulfill our desire. So if we're attracted to Krishna, we want to go to Krishna, we want to serve Krishna in our eternal loving relationship with him, then the Lord will fulfill that desire as well. Uh, and certainly if we are recommended by uh, Srimati Radharani or, or anyone, on Friday evening, we celebrated or commemorated uh, the, the life and passing away of a very nice lady devotee named Palika Devi Dasi, the wife of Mahaprabhu Das and mother of Shama Dasi and Giri Govardhan Das. And I think it was Giri Govardhan in his talk, he was saying that uh, how amazing it is that his own mother had gone to Krishna because now he has like a real in because she can recommend him. <laughs> like in, uh, in the material world, I think it's a, it's a sort of a negative saying that it's not what you know, but it's who you know. 
is a sort of a criticism of the system. That you know, you may be you may be a very good student, but you won't get the top honors if you don't know you know the top people. <laughs> but that's sort of the the inverted reflection of the eternal truth. It's true. It doesn't matter what you know, but it matters who you know. So if you know someone who is in a position to recommend you to Krishna, uh, and, and if Krishna has that relationship with that devotee, and that is Krishna's mood to fulfill the desires of his pure devotees, then uh, your path is clear. So this is a, uh, although our process is, is very simple, deceptively simple, but it's very potent. And if one sticks to it, uh, you know, without duplicity, but sincerely sticks to it, then uh, we can all be back with Krishna and, and be, be with each other in our purified state of consciousness with the spiritual form just suitable for serving Krishna. And we don't have to leave anyone behind or anything behind, but we just purify everything through associating with Krishna, through Krishna consciousness. And uh, we can have an eternal party <laughs> with Krishna. We can dance together with Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are, are there any questions or comments? Mahaprabhu Das? Is there a, a traveling microphone? Maharaj, wonderful class from the purport of Srila Prabhupada. Excellent. Uh, Maharaj, you have talked very extensively on the subject of ghost hunted, <laughs> hunted houses, hunted people, and by chanting Hare Krishna, you know, that ghost will go. And we have seen many devotee like Gaurang Puru and many, they chanted properly and the ghost has gone out and they have surrendered fully. Now, we are, I am now 36 years completed, 14 January by your mercy. <laughs> Maharaj, we, we chanted and Krishna has fulfilled the desire of many people that they have made tremendous material prosperity, 100 times, 50 times, 20 times. But the Krishna consciousness, that the haunting of the ghost is so deeply rooted in our heart that we, though we are doing ritual, chanting 16 round, we are following in, in comparison to the, you said manmanavan bhavakto or surrender, in comparison to that, the progress by the mercy of the Lord which we have made, by, because we are chanting. But that surrender, desire to surrender, when it will come, because the desire of sense gratification, even chanting is not gone. But you are, you are asking this question 
because you have a desire to surrender. So you are ask, you're asking when will that desire to surrender come? That means you have the desire to surrender. Uh, that I, I paraphrased a, a verse from Bhakti Rasamrita to Sindhu when I was speaking. Bhukti Mukti Spriha Yavat. Srila Rupa Goswami says that the desires for bhukti, that means material enjoyment or mukti, impersonal liberation, merging and becoming one with this God, Brahman, uh, are like ghosts that haunt one. And that's, the, that's where that explanation comes in. If someone's haunted by a ghost, he has desires that aren't really his. They're, they're the ghosts. So if one desires bhukti, material enjoyment, or mukti, impersonal liberation, it is like uh, being haunted by a ghost. And someone who is haunted by those desires can never relish the sweet taste of pure devotional service, bhakti. But that, uh, and, and, and like in the material world, everyone wants to become ahead of everyone else, above everyone else, more important. So that material conception culminates when one wants to become God. You know, I want to become, you know, CEO of the company, and then I want to become the finance minister, and then the chief minister, and then the prime minister. And that. So that idea of becoming greater and greater culminates in the desire to become God. So Rupa Goswami says that anyone who has these desires cannot really relish the sweet taste of, of devotional service. And to the contrary, one relishes the more one becomes the servant of the servant. In one uh, talk Srila Prabhupada gave in Detroit, uh, he, he was speaking like that, that the more you become the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant, a you know, hundred times down the line, the sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter the taste of Krishna consciousness becomes. So if we develop that mood or practice that mood, then we'll experience that uh, sweetness, and that 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 will replace these ghost-like desires for material enjoyment or impersonal liberation. But you want to. You're, you do want to. You're asking probably for the sake of others. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. You need the microphone. Oh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, thank you for a nice class. Uh, my question is, uh, whatever you said about taking dust of a pure devotee and everything, it's very directly clear that one should take a dust of one's own spiritual master. It was more, I understood that way. Uh, but where does it mention that it should be dust of dust and the instruction of other devotees as well? Because if we also connect this to Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, he says that one should approach a spiritual master and inquire submissively. But does it also mention that devotees in general? 
Yes, uh, I mean, it's stated that every, every Vaishnav is a guru. So if someone is genuinely a Vaishnav, he's a guru. And those uh, processes, tadvidi pranipatena prashtena seva, uh, of inquiring and rendering service, that applies. I mean, it may be that, you know, there could be some difference among Vaishnavas and then, uh, I mean, not considering the structure of ISKCON, but just philosophically, then one's, uh, one's own spiritual master is the uh, final authority. There was one letter Srila Prabhupada wrote that anyone who is purely teaching you what your uh, Diksha Guru, your I initiating spiritual master has taught, he can be accepted as a Shiksha Guru or instructing spiritual master. But the the important point is that he, uh, he, he is teaching you purely what your uh, initiating spiritual master has taught. And in that way, yeah, Srila Prabhupada says he's like you, your father. You have only one father, so you have only one Diksha Guru. But in a properly functioning family, you have your father, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins, and uh, your siblings. And in principle, they, they should all be uh, supporting what your father says. You know, if they say something different, then it'll create havoc. And sometimes Srila Prabhupada said that uh, the, it, our goal is to become uh, part of Krishna's family. That Krishna is the head of the family. So he's saying like in a family, everyone cooperates to, to serve and please the head of the family. The wife, the children, uh, the, the the servants he even mentioned the animals, the the they all work together to um, to to please uh, the, the the head of the family. So he was saying that. So we want to be part of that family where Krishna is the head, and we are all work, every every you know. Everyone in the family is working uh, to please the, the head of the family. Hare Krishna. Yes, last, perhaps, last question. They become ghost. But uh, psycho uh, psychologically speaking, um, it is said that uh, there is no such thing as a ghost. It's just a byproduct of the uh, of our mind. So, would you like to comment on this? Uh, I I didn't catch exactly what you said, but I didn't say there's no such thing as a ghost. There there are ghosts. Speaking psychologically, but well, we're not speaking psychologically here. <laughs> We're, we're, we're speaking scripturally. <laughs> I mean, I'd, maybe I didn't understand it. But there was another question. Yeah. Actually, the Vedic science is so... Uh, elaborate that there are many different types of ghosts. They have a whole taxonomy, different types of ghosts. Oh, yeah. 
They, they do exist. In fact, at the drama festival, <laughs> we learned about the Brahma Rakshasa, uh, the very powerful and evil type of ghost. But anyway, I don't want to frighten anyone. Yes. Is. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, thank you for the class. Means I want to just ask one question. Like you said, uh, we should not uh, approach directly to Krishna. We should uh, approach through the devotees. So if I have some desires, either material or spiritual, should we always uh, approach through devotees or we can also pray to Krishna? Means. As in uh, Vrindavan, that uh, Govardhan fulfills all your material desires, and uh, I also felt that, so I just wanted to ask this question. Uh, well, it is said that the devotee is more merciful than Krishna, <laughs> because if you have a material desire, uh, Krishna, but th there's actually two categories, devotees and non-devotees. If a non-devotee approaches Krishna for the fulfillment of a material desire, Krishna may fulfill the material desire. But the devotee is more merciful than Krishna because he will... Uh, only help you to fulfill fill the desires that will ultimately be good for you. In other words, to become Krishna conscious. If you are a devotee, but not completely purified, and you have material desires, um, I don't think you should approach a devotee because uh, I, I, you may not get very far. <laughs> but you could approach Krishna. And Krishna says that if someone approaches me for material desires, he's do you know the meaning of the word murka? <laughs> what is the meaning of the word murka? Huh? Fool. Yes, that's it. Fool. <laughs> <laughs> Krishna says, anyone who approaches me to fulfill material desires is certainly a murka. <laughs> but I am not so foolish, Krishna says. And I will not fulfill the material desires of a devotee if it will cause him to continue to approach me to fulfill more and more material desires. But I will deal with him in such a way that he gives up his material desires. Yes, he, Krishna says, it's like someone asking for poison. He says, I will deal with him in such a way that he gives up his material desires. And instead of giving him poison, I will give him nectar. So, yes, don't approach devotees with material desires, approach Krishna. <laughs> or give them up. <laughs> uh, There is one uh, little, little incident. Uh, Srila Prabhupada had a, uh, this was, yeah, 
uh, fairly early after Srila Prabhupada came back to India. And so he, he had a, uh, a, a boy, I think his name was Rajiv Gupta. But, so he was translating Prabhupada's books from English into Hindi. And the boy's father also knew Srila Prabhupada and he was friendly with Srila Prabhupada. So this would have been uh, in 19... Whew, 1971, after the de first Delhi Pandal at Kanat Place. So the, the boy's father came to meet Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada asked him, have you given up smoking? And the boy's father looked down, he said, no, Prabhupada, I, I haven't been able to give up smoking. Uh, can't you give me s some special mercy? I think I need some special mercy. And Srila Prabhupada replied, uh, yes, there is such a thing as special mercy. It is described by Lord Krishna in Srimad Bhagavatam. Yasya ham anugrinami harishye tadanam shanai. He says that when I'm especially inclined to give mercy to a devotee, the first thing I do is I take away all of his material attachments and possessions. And then when he's bereft of all of his wealth and rejected by his friends and family members, he will surrender to my devotees. So, so yeah, so Prabhupada said there is special mercy and that the, 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 the first installment of Krishna's special mercy is that he takes everything away from you. So, do you want special mercy? <laughs> <coughs> so the man said, no Prabhupada. No, I'll do it. I'll do it myself. I don't want any special mercy. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. What? Hare Krishna, can you please be seated? It is a, I would like to thank Giriraj Maharaj for this beautiful class, especially teaching us about what we do now. We get an appropriate body in our next life. And uh, on a serious note, uh, it brings great uh, sad emotions to inform all of you that one of our stalwart leading devotees of our congregation uh, her Grace Kirtida Madhaji, we all know her, uh, at 1.30 p.m. PM she left her body and uh, so we would like to dedicate this last Kirtan uh, in her as offering to her lotus feet and uh, we would like to just request Jagjivan Prabhu to also speak about a very, very appropriate book uh, of Giriraj Maharaj, which is very much appropriate with this recent news that we got. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Bob. Maharaj has just finished this book called the final, Life's Final Exam. And it is, as we say, hot off the press. Is that right? It has just come. Um, 
he offered it this morning in Juhu, and everyone uh, took advantage to get an autographed copy of uh, Maharaj would s will sign it also, which is not, you cannot always get that uh, offer. So today is a special day. It's not only Maharaj here, but it's also Radhanath Swami, Gopal Krishna Maharaj is giving some comments, and of course Srila Prabhupada. So it is um, a very complete uh, book about the final exam. The final exam is the point that we all will have to face at one point or another. Um, that final test, and that is death. How we leave is how we will, how we are advanced in Krishna consciousness. So, um, those who want this book, uh, I have my copy, uh, autographed by Maharaj. Thank you. <coughs> um, it's only 395 rupees today. I don't know if it'll, it may go up later on sometime in the future. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the devotees here will be <coughs> um, selling them, and anybody who wants, any who want to buys it now will be able to get it autographed by Maharaj. Okay, three ninety five, three ninety five. Okay, <laughs> this is a commission that I'm. He's giving me for for making this talk that. <laughs> This is for you. You want another book? Too many. Yes, you here. Give it to me. Maharaj. After the after the kirtan, uh, Maharaj will the, the selling will begin after the kirtan and the si selling and signing. But I already sold one here. Seems like one. One sold. I don't know for who is that for you. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare 